welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Gray. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's taking place in our own community. How does mental health and human trafficking intersect? Well, we know that if you experience mental health conditions, you could be vulnerable to experiencing trafficking. But we also know that if, you, if you've experienced trafficking, it can significantly impact your mental health. In today's episode, I have with me Dr. Jackie Linder, who's going to be shedding light on this topic and sharing her insights and expertise on this issue. Welcome, Jackie, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Just to begin with, could you share a bit about who you are to our viewers and our listeners and about the work that you're currently involved in? Yes, uh, I'm a trauma psychologist registered in both Ontario and Alberta. Um, my focus in trauma started many years ago, long before I was registered. And then about 14 years ago, I became actively involved in the human trafficking movement. I was working at a local NGO in a mental health uh, clinic here in Edmonton, which is where I'm based in Edmonton, Alberta. And I had a client come in who had been a survivor of human trafficking. She was in her early 50s and she had a tremendous amount of mental health issues. And when we started talking about what she had been through, what she had survived, I asked her, why have you never come for counseling before? And she said to me, who could I tell what had happened that wouldn't blame me for it. Fast forward a few years after sitting at a few community tables in terms of planning an anti-human trafficking response in Alberta. I did that for about three years. And then I found myself at a conference. It was a police officers conference that was based here in Edmonton. And I did a trauma presentation for the police officers on the connection between trauma psychology, post-traumatic stress disorder, addictions, and so on, and the human trafficking community. And they were absolutely blown away. And by the end of the conference, there was this long lineup of police officers who wanted to talk about what they had seen in their careers working on the front lines of human trafficking. And it was actually in that conference that I discovered that many police officers at the time, this was over 10 years ago, um, were basically investigating the crime of human trafficking by day and then running an ad hoc helpline for all the people that they had rescued at night. So police officers all over Canada tell stories of random phone calls at 2 a.m. because they're shift workers and so are the people they rescue. And they don't, uh, the people, survivors of human trafficking often don't have very rich social supports. So quite often they develop a bond with the investigating officer that extracted them from the situation. I was at the time working for City University in Edmonton, running a mental health program that trains psychologists. And so I came up with the idea of starting a national hotline for survivors of human trafficking, focused solely on mental health counseling. And at the time I got maybe 30, 35 students to assist me in terms of covering all the shifts. In the old days, I used to cover a lot of shifts myself. And now we have about 50 volunteers who wow. actually work on the line 24 seven. So survivors all across North America can call us at any point in time and they can speak to somebody for up to an hour for free about what's going on in their lives. Wow, what an inspiring story, Jackie, where you met an individual who had experienced this kind of trauma through trafficking and then you sought different ways to make a difference, first through educating others and then connecting with students and building this hotline to be able to support people across mm -hmm. the nation. That is just truly amazing. So you mentioned this phone number that exists and um, I know it's referred to as the Chrysalis Anti-Human Trafficking Network. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious to know what population group does Chrysalis primarily serve? And when someone calls that number, how does your team come alongside them? How, how does someone support that individual who's calling in? Mm -hmm. So first of all, all of our volunteers are graduate level master of counseling students. So, or they are already psychotherapists. We have a couple of volunteers from Ontario who are professional psychotherapists. And so they have to have a background, a fundamental background in mental health. It has to be at the graduate level. And then on top of the baseline training and skill that they bring to the volunteer process, we also provide about 40 to 50 hours of 
specific training in the trauma of human trafficking so that by the time the volunteer speaks to someone on the line, they have some context. Now, human trafficking is very varied. And in the decade that the Chrysalis Line has been active, far and away, the vast, vast majority of our callers are sex trafficking survivors. The line is actually open to labor trafficking, but we tend not to get them. Primarily what we get is sex trafficking survivors, and we get calls from all over North America, lots of callers from Ontario. Um, I have over the years talked to many, many people based in Toronto, which is, of course, connected to Pearson Airport. And so there's lots and lots of trafficking going on there, but it goes across the board in Alberta, certainly in the oil boom days um, between Red Deer, Fort McMurray, Edmonton and Calgary, there was this, this giant triangle of people being moved around. Um, so a caller, there's two key things about the line. Um, if, and people don't have to actually call about human trafficking. We have what I refer to as emancipated sex professionals. These are people who are in the commercial sex industry, um, but they are there. They are not being controlled or managed or coerced by another person. They're essentially individual corporations of one. They have a lot of uh, control about who they see, when they see people, nobody's taking their money away, et cetera, et cetera. But they too are quite marginalized in our society. So sometimes they'll call chrysalis. And I, over the years, in my own uh, work on the line, I've had people who were being trafficked, trying to figure out how to escape. I've had people who were actually in the process of escaping. One memorable case that I worked on was a lady who called from Ontario. Uh, she was actually, it was about 4 a.m. Ontario. No, it would have been 6 a.m. Ontario time, 4 a.m. my time. And um, she had just been battered by her trafficker, who happened to also be the father of her child. And she was on a like literally on the road when she was calling. She was out, she had run out of the house and was on the street walking. She had her mobile phone with her, and she called us. And so I was able to connect with some allies of mine in Ontario who went, to, they connected with local police, and they actually went to her home. Uh, we had like two telephones going. <laughs> they went to her home and they. They collected her, they collected her infant who was trapped inside the house with this angry man. Um, the gentleman was arrested. I don't know how his part of the story ended, but those are the kinds of calls. We also have people who are not in a position to either leave the world of commercial sex or are not ready to do so. And we talk about what's going on in their lives and, and how are they practicing self-care and what are their options and how do they, if they're going to be in the work, how do they do it safely, that kind of thing. So the conversations are wide and varied and incredibly rich. I've had some of the most rich conversations of my clinical career with survivors of human trafficking because they've been through a lot. But, but they also have an incredible amount of grit. Um, and the book that I'm writing right now, which has been stalled due to COVID because I've been really busy in my clinical practice as a result of the pandemic. But the book that I'm writing right now is, um, I'm about 500 pages in, I'm still chipping away, um, is on, uh, it's, uh, the rough title is Soul Loss and Heroism and Survivors of Human Trafficking. And I selected that title because over the years, the people that I have spoken to who are in that world, exited that world, or are not ready to exit, um, have are philosophically some of the most interesting, insightful people in terms of human behavior, human psychology, the dynamics. And I remember a young man who used to call the line for about three years. He eventually exited and um, called us to let us know that he, we wouldn't be hearing from him anymore because he was out. Um, and he said to me once, do you think I should get out? And I said to him, and he was being trafficked by another man. And I said to him, I think you're asking the wrong question. And he said, well, what's the right question? I said, are you happy doing this kind of work? And do you see a future for yourself, a future that you dream of? And he said, no, I, I actually can't do this kind of work unless I'm using, unless I'm high. Uh, I'm not happy. I don't actually have a life outside this work. And I don't see myself, I don't see a future for myself here. So ultimately what he started doing was saving his money from his sex work to go to university. And he actually completed his schooling and used that as a bridge out of the sector. And as far as I know, um, he is now in a completely different career.
Wow, so much of what you shared um, really resonates with me and my own experience journeying along survivors. You used the word grit and mm -hmm. just the individual's resiliency um, despite the trauma that they've faced, the exploitation they've experienced to pursue their dreams, to make a better future for themselves and their family. Um, it's really inspiring. So I'm really excited to read your book and the lessons that you've learned. I'm wondering, I know you probably have a thousand that you can share, but is there you know, a, a key lesson that you have taken away from your conversations from these individuals that you've connected with over the years? Mm. I have spoken with many police officers and I interviewed eight of them for the book that I'm writing. And, and we all share a deep, um, as one officer put it, deep regard and admiration for the, the sex trafficked community because they're some of the bravest people we've ever known. I mean, when you hear the stories of what people have overcome, what they've survived, you just can't believe anybody still gets out of bed, and yet they do get out of bed, and they are functional. And a lot of people do sex work to look after their kids and to keep a roof over their heads, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is missed in our dominant society. People in the human trafficking community are literally treated like throwaway objects. And, and I, I don't mean people buying sex. The people buying sex don't see people in the industry as real people. I mean Joe, Jane, average public who, for the decade plus that I've been doing public speaking and all of my colleagues and allies across the country have been doing public speaking, it's amazing to us how many people don't think human trafficking is going on in their communities. And I keep going... What do you mean? I mean, it's been on the news. It's been in every print. It's all over the internet. How do you not know this is happening? And for me, what I see is one of the reasons it's so hard for survivors to exit is because they don't have a safe community to return to. And that comes from the social stigma of the sector where people are blamed, lots and lots of victim blaming going on. But even if people start in what I consider to be emancipated sex work and then are ultimately uh, trafficked, they're still blamed. At the end of the day, they're, um, they're treated like you know, creatures in a zoo. Oh my goodness, you were trafficked. And so people fail to see the, the humanity mm -hmm. behind the experience and the profound depth of suffering, but also of integrity and generosity that I know to be endemic to the population. People who have nothing to give and nothing left to lose will jump into situations to help save your life, to prevent somebody from stealing your money, et cetera, et cetera. And we just don't see that going on in the dominant culture. And I think we have a lot to learn from the community. Yes, absolutely. And I really appreciate what you have to say about that because we can sometimes get fixated even on statistics and numbers, or like you mentioned, there's some social stigma and judgmental attitudes towards individuals, not recognizing that they're a person with intrinsic value and worth, and that has unique needs and unique experiences and needs to be supported and loved and cared for as such. So I'm really looking forward to continuing this discussion and conversation with you today. Thank you, Jackie, for sharing your expertise and insights. We will be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that is prevalent in our communities across Canada. Today, I have with me Jackie Linder, who is shedding light on how mental health and human trafficking are connected. So just to jump right back into this conversation, Jackie, I was wondering if you could share some of the ways that trafficking affects someone's mental health. You've mentioned how you know it causes trauma. What kinds of trauma do you see in supporting and journeying alongside these individuals? Well, it's very interesting. So absolutely, we know that human trafficking, and by definition, when I talk about human trafficking, I'm talking about forced commercial sex work. 
non-consensual uh, commercial sex work, which actually has a significantly different psychological profile associated with it. And even survival sex work where you're not being forced is also a little bit different. But for the purposes of this conversation, we're thinking about classically trafficked people. Someone is controlling me, somebody's manipulating me, somebody's coercing me, somebody is hurting me. So there is a huge vulnerability, very interesting. Um, traffickers are excellent at identifying already vulnerable people. It's one of the reasons that um, they tend to prey on younger females who are socially isolated, somewhat marginalized, quite likely have a significant adverse childhood experience background. What we know from the ACE studies is that on the classic list of 10 terrible things that can happen to little kids, if you have more than four, four or more is the cutoff, then it massively increases your risk of mental health issues, um, physical issues, increases your risk of cancer and all kinds of other cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera, depression, IV drug use, et cetera. So what we know in terms of domestic sex trafficking is that traffickers prey on the vulnerable, usually people who are pre-injured. So a lot of young Canadian citizens are lured into human trafficking. They already have signs of mental health issues on board. The most, the two diagnoses that are most strongly correlated with sexual violations of any form are post-traumatic stress disorder and psychological dissociation. PTSD is that classic intrusion, avoidance, hyper arousal, as well as cognitive distortion. And we do know that in terms of all interpersonal trauma, that's, you know, muggings, assaults, batteries, um, which is actually worse than being in a car accident or being in a hurricane or a wildfire. Because in a car accident, a hurricane or a wildfire, people are more likely to come and help you. We are a social mm. society after all. But in an interpersonal violence situation, especially inside the family, people tend not to want to get involved. So you are socially isolated, you are alone, you are helpless, and they're probably isn't anywhere to run. In these kinds of contexts, when sexual violence occurs, the violation of the body is the final boundary. So when I do human trafficking training across, across Canada, which I've done for all, all, over a decade, one of the things I ask people all the time is, would you rather you know, be beaten with an inch of your life and have your limbs broken, or would you rather be raped? And everybody, across the board says, I'd rather be beaten within an inch of my life. And then I say, why? How come? What's, what is it about that level of violence that's more acceptable than being raped? And people's answers differ. But at the end of the day, my belief is that when somebody is sexually violated through the mouth, the anus, or the vagina, the last line of defense has fallen, and the body itself becomes the scene of the crime. You don't escape it unless you commit suicide. So you carry the crime scene with you in a human trafficking scenario in a way that is completely atypical. And so what, all, what, what option does someone have except to try and escape this violated body? if they can. And so post-traumatic stress disorder is a unique psychological disorder and sexual violation is highly correlated with PTSD and psychological dissociation is also highly correlated with PTSD. And it's probably because nature has designed us to spiritually in terms of our mind or our spirit or our soul, if you prefer that language, to leave the body if we can't get the body away from the threatening situation. So we go, human bodies going to this stress-induced, analgesic, spaced out. I'm not really here. I'm actually floating on a ceiling tile, observing somebody do this to my body. And those forms of psychological injury are hard to detect unless you're working with a specialist. They persist for years untreated, if not a lifetime. There are many things we can do to heal those injuries, but you almost always need to work with a trauma specialist to have access to those kinds of tools and materials. So we have this pre-injured young group of people who probably already have PTSD and depression, low self-esteem and dissociation. They're lured into human trafficking. Well, from their perspective, it's not that much different from the life they've already lived. We also have younger people who are 
they have a pretty stable background, but through the Romeo grooming style of a trafficker who pretends to be the boyfriend and gets you to love her or him and then slowly nudges you in the direction of human trafficking thinking all of the resources and the resilience that you had as a kid can over time be broken down through physical injury, psychological manipulation, brainwashing, deprivation, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, um, what we see in the human trafficking population is known as complex trauma. And simple trauma is a term we use to something like a really bad car accident. You come from a good family. You have a good baseline to the building, the foundation of the house that is you. You've got a solid concrete pad. A hurricane blows through called a car accident, knocks out the windows and the doors and half the roof, but you still have structural integrity. That type of what's called simple trauma is far easier to treat and has a much better prognosis of recovery. And it takes less time to do it because you have something to work with. In the context of what's called complex trauma or P with the PTSD and dissociation and depression and addiction and self-loathing, they're all happening at the same time. The difference between simple PTSD and complex PTSD is the difference between a four-legged stool and a 50-legged bench in terms of complexity, and all survivors of human trafficking are in the complex trauma category. So they need many different kinds of interventions for stabilization. They need somatic interventions. They need cognitive, emotional, quite often psycho-spiritual interventions. That is why they actually need to work with specialists. And we don't have enough trauma specialists in Canada to work effectively with this population. So when you talk about this complex trauma that individuals experience and that you and your team are encountering through this hotline, you did just share a number of interventions. What does that look like? What does trauma-informed care and support and mental health services look like to actually assist someone in their healing journey? Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that we have to do is help people stabilize and regulate. So ultimately, most people think of psychological trauma as a psychological injury. We call it psychological trauma after all, but it is not in fact a psychological injury. It is a biological injury. What happens is when a human organism is exposed to threat, danger, near death, violence, and pain, it alters their baseline physiology sometimes permanently. So the psychological dysregulation people experience is not because there's something wrong with their head. It's because there's something wrong with their vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10 comes out the back of your head. And the vagus nerve plugs into like all the major organs of the body, as well as into the striated muscles of your face, which is why when you look at somebody's face, you, you can tell whether they're safe to approach or they're a scary person that you have to run away from because our facial muscles cue other members of our species, yes, come close or don't mess with me, right? We're actually built that way in terms of evolution. What happens in the context of trauma is if you think of the vagus nerve as the, a gear shift on a, a, like a standard car, most of us drive automatics, but just run with the metaphor. So this gear shift to have a happy, positive life where you're emotionally grounded and regulated, your gear shift needs to be in gear one, which is the gear that is associated much like this conversation with a warm sense of connection with another person. That emotional feeling that we're sharing in this interview we think it's psychological, but its root system is actually in the physical nervous system itself. So we are both in what's called a ventral vagal state right now. I like to use the metaphor of, you know, the care bears, care bear share where their little hearts were popping up. <laughs> in their chest. The care bear share stare is basically the ventral vagal state. That is the evolutionary um, inheritance of every happy mammal. And if you're going to be a happy mammal, your vagus nerve, your autonomic nervous system needs to be in that gear and no other. If you have been harmed, violated, sexually assaulted, sold, anything betrayed, 
that is not the gear shift your body is in. You're in gear two, which is the fight flight. Somebody's out to get me. Watch, watch, watch. Who's going to stab me in the back? That hypervigilant state has a lot of physiological blowback. It changes your brain chemistry. It increases your stress hormone in your blood, blah, 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 which changes the way your brain processes information and it alters your mood. And then gear three also known as the disconnection gear, the dorsal gear, which is like the dorsal fin of a shark on your back. That is the gear that came, we inherited it from our reptilian ancestors. It's your turtling, I'm just going to shut down all of my organs now and pretend you're not out there and you can't get me. That is actually the gear that is active in our physical bodies when we're depressed or dissociated, checked out, spacey, disconnected. So the challenge is that we actually have to help regulate both the vagus nerve in the body itself as well as the mind. So to ground and relax, we can breathe, we can tap. There's all kinds of things that you can do to stabilize. But if you're front line and you're not a clinician, you're working in this population, you have to understand that a lot of the behavior that you're seeing, a lot of the thoughts that are, that are, um, being displayed a lot of the language that people are using they're not fully in control of the trauma is happening to them not the other way around so trauma-informed care consistently looks like an ongoing awareness and attunement to the biophysiological psychological state of the client and then adapting your intervention strategies and your organizational policies in the direction of client stabilization, which requires a lot of flexibility in systems. And so far, we're not that good at it. Well, Jackie, I feel like we're just scratching the surface of this conversation. And it has been amazing to have the opportunity to learn from you today and to hear your knowledge and your expertise on this topic. So we're definitely going to have to have you back on the show to do a part two, maybe a part three to unpack this a bit more, but I do want to thank you so much um, to you and your team for the important work that you're doing at the Chrysalis Anti-Human Trafficking Network to support survivors and to journey alongside them um, in support of their healing. And so if you are tuning into the show today and you could benefit from accessing this counseling service, please call one 866 528 If you are in a situation of immediate danger, and it's safe to do so, please call 911. You can also get information and support at the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline to report a situation of trafficking at 1-833-900-1010. Again, that's 1-833-900-1010. Thanks so much for tuning in and we hope to catch you next time on Freedom Fighters Code Gray.